Hi, welcome at today's masterclass about having meaningful relationships. My name is Lisanne and I will be your host during this upcoming hour. Um, and as I said, we will be talking today about relationships. Uh, for years after year, relationships are the number one uh, thing that make us happy. And as our founder Gijs Koppens told us in our previous webinar about happiness, happiness actually means, amongst other things, someone to love. Today we will be talking uh, and guiding you through a lot of information about having meaningful relationships. Um, my colleagues and psychologist Eert Meerte Verkuilen and Irene, Irene Bakker um, are here today to guide you through all of this in the upcoming 25 minutes. Um, after the presentation there will be a live Q&A. Uh, you can ask all your questions in the box on the right and uh, yeah, let's give it a shot. Um, here's my colleague Meerte Verkuilen. Thank you very much, Lisanne. So Irene and I are going to talk about relations, and we made a nice selection of topics within the topic relation for you. First, yeah, let's create some kind of mindset about what relations are, what is a definition, for example, what kind of relations exists. Then we will focus on couples therapy, emotionally focused therapy, a very popular therapy today. And we decided to talk about this therapy because the lessons that are taught in the couples therapy are applicable to many kinds of relation. And the lessons have something to do with human needs and communication. It's an absolute human certainty that no one can know his own beauty or perceive a sense of his own worth until it has been reflected back to him in the mirror of another loving, caring human being. Without the other, you cannot develop a sense of self. Think about the young baby or the little child. The little ones need the other to take care for them, to learn about themselves, the little ones learns about them, is learns about their needs, about their body, about their emotions, through the interaction with significant others. Without this environment of the significant others, the baby wouldn't develop a sense of self. You could see a relation, uh, you could see every contact you have with somebody as a relation. The word relation comes from the word relateren in Dutch, to relate in English, and originally it means to tell. So, thinking a bit further, you could see a relation uh, as a human contact that is based on what we tell ourselves about the other person. And we all look with our own colored glasses to the other, and we label what we see. And the label we use is dependent on our earlier experiences, eh, our needs, our values, our desires, and our upbringing. And we make a story based on what we see. And this in itself is not a problem, but it does become a problem when we start to believe our own story and start to believe that that's the truth. And for example, when you have a negative judgment about somebody, your heart will close and you won't be open anymore for that other person. For example, Irene, she's a colleague of mine, is always late. That's not true, but let's say she's always late at the office. And I am always in time. That's not true either, but for this story it's true. And I am very punctual, and I have a negative belief about Irene, and I think she's lazy, and she doesn't have her stuff together and what I do is I take some distance from Irene and I don't communicate with her and I don't work with her. But if I would have been talking with her and I would have opened myself for her, I would have known that Irene is taking care of her old neighbor every morning and that's why she's a little bit late. Open communication is very, very important and that's why we will talk about that in this webinar. So, the relation. Our lives are defined by relations. And they are defined by the relations we do have and the ones we don't have. 
And they're defined by the good ones, the bad ones, the weird ones, the close ones, the distant ones, the weird ones, the hard ones, the low and high maintenance ones, etc. There are relations you choose yourself, like your partner and friends, and there are relations that appear in your life, like family and colleagues. Some relations are for life and some relations are there just for a little while. Most studies on what make people happy, and Elisanne already mentioned the webinar happiness, most studies agree that family and relationships rank right, right at the top. The happiest people spend time with those they love. The importance of strong social connections throughout life is gaining scientific backup, having been linked with such benefits as a stronger immune system, um, a greater pain tolerance as well, and a lower risk on depression. But on the other hand, <laughs> we also find relations extremely difficult. In daily life, we face many struggles, and actually most of the struggles we face has to do with the relations we have. And relations, I think you all know that when in a company or in a family, two people don't get along that well, the whole group is influenced. So having good relations is really important for the whole, well, maybe I would say for the whole society. Because relations are our biggest source of happiness and also our biggest source of stress, we're going to open up a little bit more about relations. Each relation gives us certain things, and this is very important, and no relations can really give us everything that we want. We need all these different kinds of relations, and they're all important. For example, I really like the tailor in, uh, in the neighborhood, and I see him, well, let's say, once every two months or something, and I give him some clothes, and we have a little chat, and then we say bye-bye. That's it, but it's a very vital and positive experience every time I meet him. And this is a casual relationship. It has no... It's very... Um, yeah, oppervlakkig in Dutch, <laughs> it stays at the surface, but still it's a very important one. And for the rest, you could, uh, uh, there are romantic relationships and family relationships. There is friendship, there is professional relationship, the casual one, and the relation with yourself. And that's the longest relation you have in your life. Um, I know who I would go to when I want to relax and, I and when I want to laugh love, sorry, and, but it's not the same person I would go to when I feel extremely vulnerable. So in every relation, you, yeah, other needs are satisfied. And vice versa, my friends will call me for certain characteristics and leave me be for other ones. So we all have, we all need all these different kinds of relations. Let's practice a little bit. I would like to invite you to take a paper, a viertje, and a pen. And I'm going to pause a little bit now because I can give you some time to take it. And what we're going to do when you have your paper and your pencil, you're going to draw one dot in the middle of the paper and then you draw three circles, a small one, a bigger one, and the biggest one, around it. And we do this to, to look at the relations you have at this moment in your life. The dot in the middle, that's you. And now you can write in the, in the closest circle those people, those relations that are closest by. And in the circle, in the middle circle, the one who, who, had, who you feel a bit more distance to, and in the last one, obviously, the, the, yeah, the one who um, you have a relation with, but it's a more far away relation at this moment in your life. So it's from very important towards yeah, l less important. And when you've done that, you look at your page, at the drawing, at the circles, you see your relations, and then with an 
open mind feel what's the quality of it now and you can evaluate with every relation you see on your paper are you satisfied with it the way it is now uh, and do you think that's also does the other feels the same way about the relation what's proof what kind of proof do you have for that and the most important question are there some relations you want to improve for now we leave it at this but maybe after the webinar or in the coming days you, you could take a bit more time to do this um, exercise because it's really it, yeah, by mapping your relations you make it really insightful and you see yeah what the situation is now and you can feel what you want to change and later on in the webinar we will talk about how you yeah change something in the interaction you have we're not talking I mentioned the casual relationship but we're not going to talk about the faraway relations we talk about the more intimate ones like friendship and the romantic relationship and maybe the colleague you work very close with and for that I want to give you a small introduction introduction into the emotionally focused therapy um, because yeah, the lessons that are taught in this therapy are applicable to all sorts of more intimate relations when couples face problems that seem unsolvable you can speak of a relational problem going into couples therapy is a way to work on the situation and this popular form emotionally focused therapy is a short-term uh, therapy that is used to improve attachment and bonding in adult relations this approach of couples therapy has been invented by the doctors Sue Johnson and Les Greenberg in the 1980s and is rooted in the research on love as an attachment bond the core element of a relational problem is the fear that the other isn't there for us for you for me anymore and do you remember the baby that we needed we need to attach to our uh, caregivers in order to stay safe to survive and this need for attachment that the need for connection stays present during adult life and we can develop different styles of attachment secure attachment and insecure attachment for this webinar it leads too far to go into this topic of attachment in detail for now it's enough to say that in emotionally focused therapy the attachment needs of both partners are examined because by understanding each other's needs you can understand certain behaviors better you could say that in AFT you learn to look under the tapestry of daily tensions you learn how to communicate about emotions you learn how to listen to truly listen to each other without directly saying yes but you and when these misunderstandings can be reduced emotional connection can be established a, a little example she thinks he is quiet because he is not attracted to her anymore her fear of being not worthy is confirmed actually he is silent because he is too afraid to show his feelings the past has taught him that his feelings don't matter this is an example of how our fears and disappointments can be confirmed while we're actually looking for connection and this is typically a miscommunication in a couple's relation while both the partners are seeking for connection Irene will lead you through the needs and communication further thanks uh, Mirte hey guys also hi for me um, yeah so Mirte already uh, explained you a lot about needs and about AFT um, and I want to take you through the needs a bit more so here you already see uh, the sort of um, continuum of autonomy and connection and these are two of the basic needs we as human beings uh, need 
Um, but we're also a barrel full of contradictions, so we need both, but they are also on a different, on the continuum, on the, on the uh, end sides. So autonomy is the freedom you need to explore and develop. We need curiosity, we need change, forces that give light excitement and adventure and risk. But on the other hand, you need connection with others in order to feel safe. Uh, connection offers us security, trust, stability and continuity, which is also very important. As humans, we need to safely attach to someone in order to survive, but we also need to be connected to ourselves. And we also need space to develop ourselves the way we are. So think about young Peter. He first needs to feel safe in order for him to be able to explore and move around in the world and find out things and maybe fall and hit his head and then go back to his safe haven of his parents or other caregivers. So Esther Perel calls these the wave, the autonomy, the going outwards, and the anchor, connection, safeness. And in every adult relationship, we have these needs and we also have the contradiction of challenging to find a balance between the two. And this challenge will stay for the rest of our lives. It's normal. Besides the need for autonomy and the need for connection, we have way more basic needs. Here you see a few. Being accepted, understood, feeling important, safe, seen, heard, loved but also being approached in a loving way. All are very important to be fulfilled in our life and in our different relations, but also what Myrta already said is we can't always have it all in one relationship. What also makes it difficult for some to have the needs fulfilled is that our attachment anxiety holds us back. Let's have a look at that. So attachment anxieties are the anxieties that exist within a relationship, which are normal. It's part of human life. So this can be a fear of rejection, a fear of failure, being abandoned or controlled, not being loved or accepted or valued. And all these anxiety needs can hold us back and make it uh, sort of yeah, anxious for us to connect with someone. And this can er, give problems. Things become difficult when we lose the balance. So it's a juggling act. We're constantly seeking the balance, homeostasis. That's normal for humans. Um, and we see that in every relationship, things can also go wrong when the balance is off. So we balance the needs. We try to balance the needs. But when one need gets too much attention and uh, the other one doesn't, then problems arise. So, for instance, when we want to connect too much and we're too clingy, we can lose our autonomy. What do we value? Who are we actually? What is our identity? But on the other hand, when you're too autonomous, think you can do everything by yourself, we can lose connection with other people and become lonely. Or when we work very hard to be seen, we can lose the reality of the fact that we are already good enough as we are, right? So the need for acceptance, oh, I don't have to work so hard. What um, is the problem with this is that we're often not so conscious of what is happening. Uh, so maybe we're juggling and we're feeling like, oh, I don't know uh, how to handle everything, but we don't really understand what's going on underneath. And without knowing what's going on, you can't change anything, right? This is the relationship you have with yourself, knowing what do I need, what is it that I miss. So what you see here is that Start asking yourself, what is it that I need right now? What is my basic need? Is it acceptance? Is it to be loved? Is it uh, to have more autonomy? And also ask yourself, what do I miss in this relationship? What am I afraid of? What anxiety is, is triggered here in this relationship? And when you are conscious of those two, then you can start taking action. Communicate about what you need and change. I say communicate and I want to talk you through that a bit more because that is often also a problem, right? Maybe you know your need, maybe you know what you miss, but then. What we see in relationships is that um, there are often communication conflicts um, that you see here. These are three of the uh, most common ones. Um, and what you see here is that 
um, in the first one, two people attack. So we're shooting arrows at each other, we blame each other, we get angry, and we sort of have all these files piled up after, uh, behind ourselves, and when, when we become angry, we bring up the past, right? In Dutch we say, oud koeien uit de sloot halen. Old cows out of the, I don't know, the, the, the sloot. Uh, what we mean with that is that when something happens in the right here, right now, you blame for all other things, right? So we have to burn those files to, in order to connect again. The second one is that one person starts shooting arrows and the other person, instead of shooting arrows back, sort of withdraws and stays behind the wall and doesn't do anything anymore, moves away. The third one we often see is that both people leave the situation. So they're sort of both on an island, there's no connection between them anymore. Um, and what we often see is that people start focusing on other things or other people. So this is the example where one person, for instance, becomes a partner in a big firm and the other one maybe falls in love with someone else, right? So we lose connection, we withdraw. So give yourself a moment to think like, what is it that I often do? What is it that I recognize in my relationships? This is not only for your partner relation, but also for friendships or in family. What do you do? It can be that you recognize all three, but we often have sort of a preference. With the help of the EFT model, we can go a bit more in depth. This is the model of EFT you see here. Um, and this helps you to understand what happens in certain situations. So by understanding what happens and become conscious of it, you can change the way of behaving and communicating. Above the middle line, we sort of see the above the surface. And above the surface is what we objectively see in a situation. Underneath the surface, we see what is underlying it and what is actually happening there. So if we look at this uh, example, uh, we see that person B starts blaming person A because person A forgot the cheese from the market. This triggers, under the surface, a fear of failure in person A. He thinks, oh, I did it wrong, oh no. And what he or she does is withdraw, so move away from the situation, distancing himself. What that again then triggers in person B is a fear of abandonment. Where are you going? I just asked you something, right? But the fear is actually small, but what you see outside is anger, even more anger, more blaming. Why are you leaving? Where are you going? Why don't you respond to me? Which then again triggers more failure in person A. This is how this lemmasket is going. So we trigger and we trigger again each other. What we actually see here, if you look at the bottom, is person B wants to connect. Hey, I, need some, I asked you something and I want to do things with you together. Person A wants to feel ex uh, accepted and appreciate, uh, appreciated. And if we would talk more from those needs, then we wouldn't start blaming each other so much. It's quite a difficult model, so let's look at a couple more examples. This is an example at work. Maybe Mirta already told you a little bit about being too late, but this is another example. So let's say um, person B makes all the presentations at work and B thinks A doesn't help me. B starts blaming A, which again triggers failure in person A. A withdraws, behaves like nothing is going on, but in the meantime bottles up all his frustration. This again triggers in person B that B doesn't feel seen. He's trying to connect, but actually creating more distance by behaving the way he does. And what we now see is that then he starts blaming even more, person A withdraws even more, and we have a conflict. While actually we want to connect, we see above the midline that there is more distance, right? If you look at this, you see distance. If you look underneath the surface, you see that person B wants to be valued for the hard work and person A wants to be accepted for who he or she is. Connection. What the solution now might be is that person B starts uh, uh, stating boundaries. Hey, I notice that I don't feel valued or I need to be valued for my hard work, which gives A the possibility to say, 
I understand. I find making presentations difficult. I hope you can accept that in me. Connection. Another example in a love relationship is this one. So, uh, let's say person A and B are sitting at the table after a hard day work. Uh, B is talking about the day and A just walks away to the kitchen. B starts talking more and more, posing more and more questions and saying, where are you going? What are you doing? Why are you not responding? And person A feels like, ooh, I don't do everything good. I will withdraw. This leads to a feeling of uncertainty in B. Why is A not listening? Where are you going? But not stating that, but pushing more and more, stating more and more questions and so forth, leading A to withdraw even more. So the connection is again lost. We see that the communication uh, conflict here is that B is shooting arrows and A is standing behind the wall and sort of withdrawing from the situation. Underneath, again, is that B is actually uncertain. So the anxiety is, hey, where is he going? Why doesn't he... Uh, why isn't he here for me? And in person A, we see also uncertainty. Ooh, I do it wrong. But underneath both of that is person B wants to be loved, person A wants to be valued. Again, here it would be key and a solution if person B could just say, hey, when you are silent when I'm talking to you uh, and you walk away, I feel uncertain. I'm, I'm afraid that you're abandoning me or that I don't care, that you don't care about me enough. And I would really want you to see me for who I am and be interested in who I am. And person A can then say, I understand, but I'm just tired and I was not able to listen to you. But when you become irritated, I feel like I fail, which makes me walk away from you and not feel valued for who I am. Again, connection. Maybe you also notice my tone of voice, right? I, I hear it when I say it that... When I'm above the surface, I'm more like angry and I'm irritated or I'm going away. When I talk more about my needs and my values and what I find important and what I'm anxious for, it's from a place of, oh, sorry, but help me, right? It's way more communicative, strong. What now? Maybe you think, oh, well, nice model, but uh, how to do this in real life, right? Well, Mirta in a minute is going to help you with one circle for yourself, um, but these things can also help you communicate. So when you notice yourself being in a conflict with someone, give yourself some room. You don't have to do this right away, but just go back home, find your lemon kit, see, hey, what's going on? What is it that I fear in this situation? What is it that I need in this situation? And then you can start communicating about it. We always want you to communicate from the I. So don't say you did this and you did that. No, but I noticed that I feel something. This is your responsibility. Your behavior, your thoughts, your emotions are your responsibility. So you can say, for instance, I noticed that I start blaming you. That's the surface behavior. And I'm feeling angry, which is also the surface emotion. And I think that my behavior leads to you withdrawing from the situation. And I notice that I'm angry, but that I'm actually scared, which is the attachment anxiety. I'm scared that you reject me or that you don't like me or that you don't love me anymore. And what I actually need is to feel connected with you. That's important to me. I value that. So is it okay for you to give me a hug? Right. So what you see here is that we go from the up, from the above the surface, to below the surface where you can start stating your needs and asking for what you need from the other person. Mirte is now going to lead you through a summary and an exercise to help you a little bit more with uh, putting things into practice. Thank you, Irene. Um, yeah, we're almost at the end of today's webinar question there of course there's the Q&A um, let's go back to the beginning and let's well summarize a little bit um, relations are very important um, they even help us form our sense of self without the other uh, we, we cannot develop that there are different kind of relations um, a very distant ones and very close ones um, and we all need different kind of relations and not 
a single relation can fulfill all our needs. From the emotionally focused therapy, um, we've learned that communication is key. Um, I'm thinking what we also learned there, and what I'm thinking is that actually what you learn also in the in that Lemnis cat from the emotionally focused therapy that the relation with yourself is really important because you yeah, you, you saw these layers the above the middle line and beneath the middle line and these are all layers inside ourselves and when you are aware of what's happening in all those layers um, your communication becomes more true more profound more authentic um, and that helps you in uh, to connect with other people um, Irene told about the different styles of conflict, the two are shooting at each other, one shooting at the other and the other running away, or two running away and then there's no connection anymore. Um, and then uh, there was the Lemnis Cat and what I wanted to do now is to uh, fill one in together with you. So here in the screen you see one, an empty one. and Maybe you have your paper with the circle, so you can turn it around and then draw the Lemnis cat. Or, of course, it's also completely fine to do it in your head. Um, and then we, st with this Lemnis cat, start with what is objectively happening. Uh, person A, so you're person B. Person A did something that you didn't like. true and what person a did this his or her behavior affected your feelings visible emotion and what was that emotion and then what did you do behavior you can also fill in probably what the emotion was from person a yeah, what did what did A do? Did he yell back? Then there was the emotion anger. Did he run away? Maybe the emotion was fear. But that you can fill it in for the example you have in mind. <coughs> if you have an example in mind right now, and otherwise maybe later on you can think of one and then fill it in. What you then do is you move to the uh, underwater world. What might be, yeah, so let's say you were angry. What might be the underlying emotion? And often anger is a reaction to pain, to hurt. So probably that there is some hurt there inside you. And think about, connect, what might that hurt be? What attachment anxiety was touched? abandonment, not being worthy enough, not being loved, feel. And what you then can do, so then you have the e deeper emotion and the need to connect, for example, and then you can jump into person A's reality, feelings, and now, of course, this is a bit superficial because person A isn't next, uh, next to you. But imagine if you are angry or if, if, if your visible emotion was anger, how might that affect person A under the middle line? And imagine what would a need of person A be? Probably he also wants to be seen and loved and accepted. So this is something you, uh, yeah, in many situations actually, you can think about this Lemnis card or draw it and analyze afterwards, hey, hey, I was angry or I had a conflict and then in a quiet moment, analyze and feel what, what was happening. And, and this Lemnis card is quite, um, yeah, has proven to be quite effective. If you have any questions also about the Lemnis card, of course, it, you can ask it in the Q&A, um, because that's what we're 
going to do next. <laughs> and if you want to learn more about the webinar, here you see some of our sources and Esther Perel and Sue Johnson are really, and also Machtel, oh, all of them, <laughs> they're real, <laughs> um, yeah, the, the key speakers and thinkers of, uh, of relations nowadays. It's really a profound literature they offer. Wow, Irene and Myrthe, thanks for all these interesting insights you just gave us, me and uh, all the viewers back home. Um, three words that really stick with me throughout this whole presentation, behavior, needs and communication, right? And it really got me thinking like, wow, communication, it's so simple but so hard at the same time and the most important thing to do, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And also, I was thinking about the known saying that we tell, like, you first have to love yourself before you can love someone else. Like, what, what is true in that? Hmm. That's a good question. Yeah. Because it, 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 it is true, it got, <laughs> I would it, say. It yeah. got me thinking because yeah. uh, when you then look at your behaviors and the needs you have and the way you maybe respond, maybe mm -hmm. that's also a bit of working on yourself and loving yourself and accepting maybe yeah. some lesser parts of yourself, mm -hmm. um, which then helps you further in all your other relationships as well. Very true. Yeah, well, I always have a bit of a difficulty with the stating that you can't love someone uh, if you can't love yourself, because I think a lot of people have difficulty with loving themselves, and that would mean that they do not love anyone else. Yeah. Um, and I don't really agree on that. But what I do agree on is that if you have a good relationship with yourself which is very important when and will help you throughout your life i think you can have more deeper feelings of love and connection because you feel safe yeah. and when we don't feel safe in ourselves it's also sometimes difficult to feel safe in the relationship you have with someone else so of course it is a sort of a helpful thing to love yourself to love someone else but i don't think it's a it's imp impossible to love someone else if you don't love yourself. Exactly. It's not necessary. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, okay. Um, up front for the, uh, for the masterclass start, we uh, received some questions as well. Um, so we'll just start off with some. Um, someone asked us, like, how do you deal with it when someone is maybe no longer a good fit for you, a friend who you've been uh, hanging out with in the past, but you noticed, like, there's getting some friction right now. I don't want to see you mm. that often anymore. How do you cope with that? Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, we thought about this question yeah. uh, already a little bit. And it's a common topic, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it, is, of it is. Yeah. 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 And nowadays it's, of course, less easy to unfriend. There maybe 40 years ago it was more easy to just go with the flow and, and take some more distance, yeah. but it's more difficult now. It, uh, I would say also here talk about, uh, think about the needs. And when, when there's more friction, then probably there has been uh, the, 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 the needs of person A, but probably also person B, haven't been, have been neglected in, in, in that relation. Yeah. And then yeah. at the surface, you see more distance. conflict and more, maybe more, or, or one has more need for distance and the other one has more needs for attachment. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So I think it's, it's important to ask yourself, like, is this something that we, uh, am I now avoiding talking about what is actually happening and what I'm actually feeling? And is that why I sort of create two islands? And I think if it just bleeds out, then I'm fine and I, I have to avoid uh, any difficult conversation. Or if it's just normal that in every part of your life you sometimes have a connection with some person and in another part of your life someone else suits you better, which is also just normal. And I think most people know for themselves, are we just not on the same page anymore? 
or are we avoiding a very difficult conversation? Exactly. Yeah. And then is it necessary to, to have that conversation when you feel like I need to, to talk about it? Or is it also a strategy to just like let things go? Yes. When you want to stay in a relation, yeah. then you need to clean the communication channels. So then it's necessary to talk about it. When you decide it, it's, yeah, it, it's not in there for me anymore, yeah, I would say that, that that's up to somebody. That well, yeah, exactly. So yeah. I hear some people also really breaking, officially breaking up in friendship. Yeah. And I hear other people say, yeah, it, it just, yeah, organically I take more distance Close. and then, yeah. yeah, that's the way it is. Yeah. That's yeah. personal Both style. But if you yeah. feel I want to continue in this relation, yeah. then, then what I said, the channels need to be cleaned. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Clear. Agree. Cool. Um, and then someone else asks us, like, how can I set better boundaries in my relationships? Yeah, that's a common one, I think. Yeah, yeah. I can <laughs> imagine. <laughs> yeah. Well, boundaries are often about needs. So a boundary states you, this is what I like, this is what I don't like. Uh, and if a boundary is crossed and you feel yourself getting angry, for instance, you know that something that you don't like happened, right? So a boundary is crossed. Um, so I think that uh, setting boundaries starts with asking yourself, what is it that I need? What is, it, what is it that I don't like in this situation? And it also has to do with your autonomy. What is your body, your mind telling you that you find important? Um, and I think you can start stating boundaries really small. Uh, so that can already be in the Albert Heijn um, when someone uh, asks you if you want to recede and you are normally always saying yes, but you actually don't want to recede, you start saying no, right? It can, and you can start elaborating on that a bit more to yeah, notice how do I feel the best fit in my life um, and um, teach yourself to say no more often. Yeah, and just start small. You don't yeah. have to directly go into the problem situation. No, 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 no. Indeed, that's a good tip. I see. Also, and 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 investigate. I would say what is stopping you from setting the boundary, mm. and then you go into the underwater underwater world, and you see probably that your need is that that the fear is that you will lose the other. So. Then, w yeah, when I said, I think the fear is when I set a boundary, the other will walk away. Yeah, exactly what you said in the webinar at the start. Like most problems are actually coming back to the fact that connection is lost, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. But then you lose, if you don't do this, you lose the connection with yourself. Exactly. Yeah. So that is again what I said with the juggling is that you have a lot of people that always say yes, that don't state boundaries that are afraid of the rejection or the abandonment or the fear of losing someone. But what they actually do by constantly saying yes to things they don't like is first of all, create distance to themselves. Who am I? What do I find important? But also doing things against their will, which often makes people angry yeah. uh, underneath. Yes. Um, but what they also do is they don't have a, a real connection with someone because you're not in it for yourself, you're in it for someone else. So often a boundary is way safer and way more connecting because the other person knows, ah, okay, no, you don't like this. No, okay, that's fine. Yeah. Right. And you need evidence yeah, because you think when I set a boundary, then somebody will walk away. So <laughs> I'm not going to set a boundary. And that feels true until you start to, uh, like a scientist, that is it really true that something... Uh, uh, well, with gravity, it's really true. Uh, when I <laughs> <laughs> let this, this go, it will fall. That's proven. But that, that so this hypothesis is confirmed. But you need to um, check your hypothesis, yeah. and that's practicing that with setting boundaries and maybe start with the in the supermarket and when the cashier really <laughs> runs away <laughs> so when you say no i don't want a receipt then maybe it's <laughs> yeah <laughs> maybe it's true <laughs> yeah but but a good point and you just just try practice yeah. Yeah. experiment yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, i see that we also have some questions from the chat um 
let me read it out loud. Before I unload my different levels of under the surface, under the surface, surface stuff, should I try to find out if the other person is willing and able to focus their attention on me right now? So do I yeah. have to cope with their maybe state of mind at that time or can I just burst out? Mm. I guess that's the question. Mm. No, 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 no. F for communication, I would say in general, there, there's a rule. First, wait until the emotions are cold. When yeah. there's hot emotion going on, don't don't talk about the lemnis cat. But when it's that it's in the yeah. aftermath of the emotion and and you feel a bit calm anymore, then you can t together re reflect. Yeah. 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 Clear. Just yeah. in a calm state of mind yeah. for yeah. both. And then somebody else asked, so what if you already communicated how a behavior from a person makes you feel? But it just seems that they keep on going g their own way. So they don't listen. Yeah, that's a difficult one. Yeah. Yeah. So I think in couples therapy, that's often what we see is that one person is trying to fix or push and the other person isn't there yet or can't be there or right. So you're on a different level. And that's a very difficult thing because we cannot change someone else. Uh, and what I strongly believe is in that you can only do it for yourself. So also with the lemnus cat, you can try to understand yourself. Do you understand what is happening? Because the person clearly stays in the upper surface part. Um, but what do you think? Can you mentalize like what is happening in my partner, for instance, or my friend? Why is it so um, staying there? Because it's probably out of fear. And maybe that can help you to have a bit more compassion for the other person. But it can also be that this is a new situation that triggers a fear in you and that you feel like you need to take a distance from that person because it's not good for you anymore or because you can't, you f don't feel seen, for instance. And that is also boundary setting then again. I tried, I communicated, I, I did my best to say and be vulnerable. And if the other person isn't able to um, uh, move with yeah, you, yeah. move with you, yeah, then at some point you have to say, "This is I. This is it for me." Exactly. Yeah. Just indeed set a boundary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another question from the live chat summed up is: How can I avoid being influenced or getting traits from relationships with people who tend to have a negative attitude? Also boundary setting, I think, question, right? A question with who am I and who's the other person? And how yeah. will I not be influenced? Yeah, I, I also recognize it. I guess sometimes you go to people, you come home, you're like, whoa. And sometimes you go, come home and you're like, yeah, I can go to bed right away. Yeah. And I have the to question think about is, this. How, how, how can I avoid being influenced or getting traits from relationship with people who tend to have a negative attitude? Yeah, my first response, mm -hmm. but I, I'm also still thinking, is um, it can be that someone really loses him or herself in a relationship and is so attuned to the other person that who am I, but I become you. That's a possibility, but that's a different topic, I think. Um, but if you look at it from another point of view, I think it's also human because we mirror each other. Uh, and that is how we know how the other person is doing. It has to do with empathy. Um, and in that case, it's very difficult to not have it because it's a human trait and it also helps us survive and it helps us connect. Uh, because we, yeah, we sometimes need to attune to the other one's person feeling to have a meaningful connection and to be vulnerable. So then I would say it's also okay, but if you don't like the feeling you get from another person and you communicate about that and it doesn't change, well, then maybe the person isn't for you. Yeah, same that story is, again. Yeah, that is a bit what, what comes to my mind in yeah. this. Seems clear. Um... And a last question so far. Uh, what if you lack trust in your present professional relations due to a restructuring? How can you rebuild that so that you can restore meaningful relationships on a professional mm. level? After Beautiful. restructuring. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's all 
I, th I think you could say that the restructuring restruct is almost equal to a live event. Mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah, yeah. That's um, uh, th that has a massive impact because it, all your relation or, or in your working environment, you're in a completely new situation. So you're like an animal placed in a new route, and you don't know what kind of other animals are there and how to relate to them. So this person doesn't feel safe at this moment, I guess. Yeah, it sounds like, yeah, it's and secure then maybe. Yeah. The question is, how can I trust trust myself again? And trust others, maybe. And well. trust others. Yeah, and, and rebuild it and restore those meaningful relationships. It's well, a bit of multi yeah, maybe Maybe start first with that circle, draw yourself and then see in this new situation, do I already have intimate others um, and um, yeah, first investigate what the new situation is and, and, and from there, yeah, re re it's difficult to answer yeah. when, when I, I yeah, don't, but you have don't the know whole the entire yeah. story yeah, yeah, behind yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, but what I also would say is give yourself time uh, because what Mirt already said is it's a big life event, so give yourself time to figure out if you can rebuild the trust. Yeah. I think it's already really good that this person feels Addresses that, it. Yeah, yeah. that there is an insecurity and a sort of feeling of unstableness and a need for safety and connection. Um, and I think what might help is that probably when he or she has this, other people will have it as well. And what can help is to talk about this and talk about that you feel unstable and insecure and that you feel a bit like I don't know anymore a bit how to trust you and, and see what, what, what you need. And that can be that you would like to take it slow on work. Maybe it's that you need to talk about it more with your family and friends. Maybe it's that you need to sit down with your um, uh, leidinggevende supervisor, supervisor and, and talk things through. Uh, because probably there are files that has been stacked up in the whole restructuring that haven't been spoken about uh, and that still make you a bit unstable. Like, yeah, I know this happened and this happened and this happened, so am I still safe? So maybe see what those are and see if you can start a conversation about that. Exactly, yeah. And what I was also thinking, like, it's restructuring. Indeed, it may be in most cases like a, something big going on mm -hmm. you also have to get used yeah, yeah. to everything yeah. <laughs> around it and only getting used to it can take like months yeah maybe yeah, six to nine yeah. months yeah well Whoa. there the answer <laughs> <laughs> so maybe after those nine months yeah. you can exactly. <laughs> have energy yeah. and headspace for yeah. working on those yeah. relationships that's what they again. used to say yeah. that you need six to nine months to to adapt to a new a completely new situation after a life event. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then I see one last comment um, in the chat, and it's someone who's just uh, giving a comment and saying it's hard to have different kinds of relationships during COVID lockdowns. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. And uh, yeah. I think yeah. we can all just say, yeah, yeah, that yeah. is yeah. hard. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And do you have like s maybe small tips or what could he? Or she, or what he hasn't already been thinking yeah. to do. Yeah. Well, what I myself really like is it's from self compassion, and it's not an answer, but it's about understanding that this is hard and giving yourself some loving kindness in that this is hard and that you can at least keep sort of the relationship with yourself warm and uh, uh, cuddle yourself a bit more. And of course, that doesn't, um, uh, how do you say that in English? Um, replace. So replace. Thanks, replace yeah. other people. So we also need other people. But try to keep yourself close as well. And go for walks together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Walks. Walks. <laughs> walks. <laughs> the the walks solution for yeah. all yeah. mental health yeah. problems. <laughs> walks. Yeah, exactly. Well, well there are good. No, but it, it, yeah. it's, a, it's a serious problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, yeah. it is. Yeah. It is, and yeah. we don't have to laugh it away. No. But I think it's uh, it's nice, like a little note to end with, like keep yourself close and the and relation yeah. with yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mirt and Irina, again for <laughs> all these uh, nice answers. Yeah. And maybe if there are some questions from you guys from uh, at home, 
Uh, we can still answer them. You can send them to us uh, via webinar at openup.care. Um, and thank you for watching, and we hope to see you again next time.